been set and things in motion and answering questions come and take a listen if you want to learn a lesson decontaminating and sterilizing so much work goes into it no one realizes but we take it serious when we're on the scene keeping it beyond clean before every surgery splish splash we're doing our thing for the clean freaks we're heavy on the scene we got it going on Fighting so dirty, yeah, keeping it clean. Yeah, split splash, we're doing a thing for the clean freaks. We're heavy on the scene. We got it going on, running five years strong. Hey, shout out to Sterile Processing. <laughs> What's up, clean freaks? It's Hank Balch here. Uh, Happy Friday to everyone. We are live in studio this Friday talking about degrees, money, and data. Straight talk on sterile processing career growth. So if you're uh, joining me live or if you're watching here later on demand, I thank you uh, for giving me a couple minutes of your time Today to talk about, I think, a topic that's pretty important to all of us, uh, how we grow in our sterile processing careers. And I'm going to be sharing today a little bit about my growth and my experience uh, starting as a brand new technician back in uh, 2009, almost 14 years ago. Uh, It'll be 14 years in May. And so I'm going to talk about how I started and how I grew, uh, became a manager, ended up uh, directing a health system in Kentucky, then moved down to the same thing in Texas before going over to the dark side, as they say, and uh, becoming in some sense a vendor. I don't really consider myself a vendor because we don't r- really sell any product into the hospital, but uh, you know, I'm not working in the hospital every day anymore. And so it's uh, it's definitely a different side to the industry. And I know a lot of you guys are interested in uh, potentially going some direction, right? You may not be in the hospital forever. Maybe you want to become a vendor someday. Maybe you want to do some of the things that we're doing someday here at Beyond Clean. So uh, we're going to talk about that. And for those of you who are tuning in with us live, uh, I'm going to take any questions, any uh, topics of conversation that kind of fit in this theme that you want to chat about. Uh, So at any time during the stream, feel free to drop your comments or questions in the comment section below. I think we're streaming today uh, through LinkedIn, through YouTube, and through Twitter. Hopefully all those comments will come right here uh, to me during the show. If I happen to miss one of your comments along the way, I'll try to follow back up afterwards uh, to catch it up on the back end. So, As we get going today, I want to talk about, again, this whole conversation of uh, sterile processing careers. And if you've been following me for any amount of time, you know uh, I've been talking about the topic of careers and career growth and money in sterile processing for as long as I think I've been a technician. Most of you guys probably have. Um, But I know... As a uh, sterile processing technician, as I said, when I started back in 2009, I believe my starting salary was somewhere around $11, maybe 10 and some change, $11. Um, I worked the second shift at the Baptist Hospital there in Louisville, Kentucky. And as um, I think most facilities do this, In working second shift, I got what they called shift differential. Uh, And it was another dollar and a half on top of my base uh, pay, my base salary. So any hours I worked after that kind of 3.30 mark, 3 o'clock mark, I would get um, that additional $1.50 on top of my $11 or my $10 and some change. And I I thought I was uh, rolling in the dough. And, you know, considering where I had come from, uh, 
previous to working a second shift, or I guess like previous to getting into sterile processing at all, I was working as a uh, stalker at the neighborhood of Walmart. So it was one of the green ones. I don't, not everybody has the little green Walmarts, but um, it, you're used to kind of seeing the big blue ones, you know, the super stores that have all the kinds of clothes, electronics and everything. Well, the neighborhood of Walmarts, um, they're basically just grocery. So it's like a small little grocery store. Typically you kind of see them out there in the suburbs or like little parts of town. Anyways, I was working there and I was working my way through grad school. I'm going to talk about grad school a lot as we start talking here about the degrees. Uh, but I was working at grad school, uh, doing that stocking at Walmart. And I had a friend of mine who was actually in grad school with me, who uh, he was um, he was helping a guy move. And the guy who was helping to move happened to be a supervisor in a sterile processing department there in town. And, you know, through conversations, he asked my buddy, hey, are you looking for a job? And he said, yeah. And so he ended up getting my buddy a job in kind of the OR supply part of it. So it was connected to sterile processing, but it wasn't a sterile processing technician job. So my buddy who was working with me at Walmart, uh, he got that job. And then he told me he was leaving. I was like, oh, man, you can't leave me here. All by myself. Um, in a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months down the road, he reached back out and said, Hank, they're hiring in this uh, department called sterile processing. Would you be interested in uh, throwing your name in the hat? And I said, uh, yeah, I mean, that that sounds great. You know, the pay is going to be better and actually has some benefits. One of the biggest benefits at that time, and this ties into that degree conversation again, was uh our hospital had what's called tuition reimbursement. And so they would cover, I want to say that time it was maybe $2,000 a year in uh, tuition cost for their employees. And so I was like, you know, sign me up. It went into the interview and obviously ended up getting the job there in 2009. I want to give a shout out here uh, real quick to Paula Freeman uh, tuning in from Ireland. She's a second year student at Dublin University, completing her degree in decontamination management. Boom. Uh, so, Paula, I wish I could hit you on the show today because I think your perspective, you know, both from the international side, but then also just from the degree side of things is going to be very interesting to hear because I've got opinions about degrees. I'm going to I'm going to be sharing here in a moment, you know, but that's mainly in the U.S. context. So I'd really be curious to hear some more of what you think and what you got to say about everything that I'm talking about. Um, since I can't have you in the studio with me, maybe if you want to add any comments along the way, if you want to shoot me an email through LinkedIn um, uh, throughout the show or after the show, you know, it'd be great to kind of follow up and talk some more. Uh, so thank you, Paula, for uh, tuning in. Uh, yeah, so I ended up getting that uh, job back in 2009, as I said, and at the same time, I was uh, going to school in grad school, right? So that, uh, for those of you who are not clear, if you're tuning in internationally, the way the U.S. systems work, you know, we have undergraduate, uh, that's usually four years, and you end up with like a bachelor's degree, for instance, and then you got grad school, or you're going on to do your master's degree many times. And depending on what kind of master's degree it is, sometimes there's like a one-year program to get your master's. Um, it can go to three years. I was in a three year master program and then there's other ones, you know, that sometimes take even longer. So then after, uh, grad school and your master's degree, many times folks go on to do their PhD. And we have a couple of folks in the sterile processing industry now that have their doctor, their doctoral degrees. And, uh, typically what I see is, you know, PhDs in healthcare management or, or, um, or, you know, public health, those kind of PhDs are uh, common in our space, you know, some kind of business management kind of stuff. Uh, and I guess like we can get in more in depth to that here a little bit later on as well, but that's just kind of an outlay. So anyways, um, I was working back 2009, you know, got my job in grad school. And at that time, I didn't really have any intention of sticking with sterile processing. 
for a career because I was in school to do something and uh, I was paying a lot of money. Uh, I was spending a lot of time in school. So sterile processing was just to help me pay the bills and especially with the tuition reimbursement uh, to help me to pay tuition in particular. Now, as happens many times in our industry, we get folks and you may be one of them tuning in who, you know, they come in here just like me and they're like, hey, it, it's a job. It's not out in the heat and the rain and the cold. Uh, it's a job indoors and it's a job that, you know, is going to be steady. It's not going anywhere. And uh, it has benefits. Right. And for many people like myself, you know, that's very important. Uh, there's a lot of jobs out there that don't carry good benefits or uh, any benefits at all. You know, that has changed a lot, um, obviously, since Obamacare came in. But, you know, back in 2009, that uh, was a big selling point for me. So I got in. And a lot of folks like me end up getting in. And for many reasons, we just end up staying around. Like I said, I started almost 14 years ago today, and I'm still here in it. And now I don't have any plans of going anywhere else besides sterile processing. I fall in love with the industry, with the people, with the opportunity that we're going to be talking about in this show today for growth. You know, really for the opportunity to see um, various uh, growth in our industry. So it's not just growth in our careers, you know, for instance, but there's growth opportunity in technology. There's growth opportunity in the guidelines and standards. There's a million different ways that this industry needs to change and improve for the better. And that's not true, really, in a lot of the industries that you would kind of walk into today just off the street to be able to look around and say, you know what, I could, I can make an impact here. Not only on my department or my company, in my city or just my career, but you could really make an impact at a national level in your industry or an international level, like the global sterile processing space can be changed uh, by someone like you and me. Yeah, that is like totally within reach today in sterile processing. So it's a really exciting, unique place to be. I want to give a shout out uh, here to Janine. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And yeah, she's going to come visit late summer uh, to go see Paula out there. So yeah, y'all connect via LinkedIn. <laughs> Maybe you can go see Paula's department there, Janine. So that's great. Uh, yeah, so I, I want to go back here uh, to me just getting uh, started. You know, that 2009 Hank is a brand new technician. And I want to speak uh, to the new technicians that are tuning in right now who are maybe um, contemplating maybe you're not a new technician yet but maybe you're contemplating getting in uh, to the sterile processing industry maybe a family or friend uh, told you about this career and now you're googling around and you know wouldn't you know you ended up on this YouTube video uh, from this random guy on beyond clean and now you're like okay let me see He's talking about degrees. He's talking about money. Do you need a degree? How much money can I make? You're asking all those questions that we all ask <laughs> at the very beginning of our sterile processing journey. So I want to speak to you for a quick moment here and tell you, in 2023, this is a terrific time for a new technician to be stepping in to the sterile processing industry. There has never been as many resources available to you in that new technician role as there are today. I'm telling you, there are hundreds and hundreds of podcasts. That's the kind of things that we do around Beyond Clean, if you're not familiar with that. But not only podcasts, there's webinars, there's books. I'm going to talk here in a few minutes about uh, these puzzle books here that are now available on Amazon. Uh, there's books. There's music. We dropped the first sterile processing album back in uh, September. Actually, the intro to the show, you probably heard a clip uh, from one of the songs on there. But there's a tremendous amount of uh, culture in our industry today that was not there even five years ago, definitely not 10, 15 years ago. So coming in as a new technician, like, you're really coming into an industry, I think, who's on fire. We're doing a lot of things. We're getting connected. 
We're encouraging each other. We're seeing a lot of changes in the technology. We're seeing updates to the guidelines. We got a, uh, one of the most recent guidelines was updated and hadn't been updated since um, 2015. Um, and then we've had recent updates and other guidelines. We got a new guideline coming out that's going to be talking about water quality in sterile processing. And it's the first standard that's coming out on that topic before it was just a TIR report, information report. And so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of shifts going on. So as a new technician, like you're coming into some place, to an industry that is active and inspired to be doing a lot of things. And it's really a, a cool time to come in. Now, if you're not in yet, like I said, if you're still thinking about this, or if you're brand new, let's say you're within your 90 days, uh, you may be looking around the department and already <laughs> in your first week, you may be looking around and saying, um, Hank, there's not a lot of people in this department. And you know what? Um, everybody looks a little stressed out and um, tired. <laughs> it's a, what you're seeing that is unique in some sense to 2023 is you're seeing a massive uh, staffing crisis at play. Now, if you've kind of lived through the Corona pandemic and everything, you know, the whole world now is short staffed. So no surprise that sterile processing is right. Um, but we're definitely feeling it in healthcare um, primarily because we got a lot of uh retirements coming in. Got a lot of baby boomers that are kind of hanging up the scrubs and saying, hey guys, it's been great. I've been there, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, but it's time for me to take a step back to go home and, you know, put my feet up and enjoy my retirement a little bit. And so with that, you know, we're losing all these baby boomers. We've already got a staffing shortage all over the globe and definitely all over the U.S. And now within healthcare, and then you go a little bit deeper, and you may not know this yet if you're in that new sterile processing technician category, but our job, even though it's got great benefits, and even though the pay is getting more competitive, and even though all the resources and all the excitement and energy is coming now to the epicenter of the industry, it's, it's not an easy job. You're on your feet for many hours throughout the day. I was in a hospital just earlier this week, and like I said, I, I don't work every day in a hospital anymore. And it'd been a couple of weeks uh, before I'd been in the last hospital. And I was on my feet, you know, for about three hours there, just kind of standing around, not really even like walking around doing too much. And, oh, man, my feet started hurting. My calves started hurting. And I went home and told my wife, I was like, I forgot how hard it was um, standing up for eight and a half hours every single day on that hard concrete in a hospital. So, you're standing all day. If you're in decontamination, you're sweating all day. And you got water going everywhere. You got splashing and steam going everywhere. You got sweat going everywhere in your PPE. And you're uh, dealing with blood, right? You're dealing with blood-borne pathogens every single day in sterile processing as a part of your job. So it it's a hard job which takes us back to the staffing crisis, right? So if you got people that, hey, the whole world is looking to hire, uh, this is a hard job that you got to stand on your feet and have great attention to detail. You're at some risk to exposure, you know, to all kinds of things that are carried within uh, blood. And you got other kind of risks like ergonomic issues from bending and pushing and pulling. You know, there's a lot of folks who are just saying, hey, it's been nice, but not hanging around for this anymore. I got a, a sweet office job that I got the opportunity to get. Or, you know, there's new people that are considering coming in and they're weighing all these things and saying, well, I don't know. Maybe that's not what I want to sign up for. You know, maybe I want something else that's a little easier or, you know, different, right? Like not everyone wants the same thing with their career. So all that mixed in. As a brand new technician, you know, through the eyes of this brand new tech, you're probably looking around saying like, oh, man, is it always this 
uh, crazy with staffing. Is it always this hard? Is always this many trays left over? Is everyone always this burned out? Well, uh, in some sense, uh, the answer is um, kind of, right? For as long as I've been the, in the industry, almost 14 years now, like I said, we've always had issues with filling our positions. We've always had... Uh, uh, we've always had more surgical volume than we have staffing and equipment, it seems, uh, to support. There's always been challenges. Yeah, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything's rosy, you know, sunshine and roses. It's going to be great. Come on. I want to tell you, it's probably going to be hard. Um, and you're probably going to be working in teams that don't have enough people. And you're probably going to be working with equipment that's not um, not always staying up. It's got downtime, it's breaking, it's causing issues with the workflow. So that's probably going to be a reality for you as a new tech. So you got to consider that in the long term as we get into the money conversation here in a second. Then we start talking about the data of career growth. You want to be thinking about all the things that are keeping other people out. Because here's the flip side to that coin. I want to welcome uh, here, Chris, I saw your comment. I'm here, Christopher. Thanks for tuning in on our YouTube channel. So we're streaming now through uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, and through Twitter. So thanks um, for checking us out there. Chris, it, if you're not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, go give it a quick click on the subscribe button because we got a ton of great videos coming out every week. Lindsay Brown's got a great series she does. There's uh, brand new CE approved webinars coming out every single week. We got the podcast over there, articles on the go. Uh, we got another episode of our Beyond the Tour film series coming out soon. So we got another company we're going to be spotlighting through Beyond the Tour. Uh, tons of awesome stuff there. All right. So back to the new technician. Uh, yeah, we're short staffed. Yeah, it's a hard job. But the flip side to that conversation is, Anytime that you walk into an industry or think about going into an industry that has challenges, if there's other people saying, yeah, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, and, you know, there's competition in pay that's kind of pushing in from the inside and pulling uh, 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 those other people out. That actually means there is more opportunity for people who come in and for people who stay. Because you got to think, if they're short-staffed, if more and more people are retiring or leaving for whatever reasons, the people who stay get more and more valuable over time. Or the people who come and, and they look around and see the challenges and say, okay, I see the challenges, but I'm not going to let those challenges dissuade me. I'm going to jump in all the way feet first. I'm going to learn this thing very, very quickly. Those people tend to to see accelerated career growth in ways that I don't think is uh, even possible in many other industries. A great example of that, if you go back to the YouTube channel and we get done, don't leave the stream right now, you know, but after you get done watching this stream, uh, we had a live stream interview with a guy named Matthew Richardson and a guy named Jardan Carlton. And both of those guys uh, told a story about how they increased their compensation very quickly through a number of just real practical strategies. Number one is getting in and learning the industry, soaking it up like a sponge as quickly as they possibly could. So let me take you back now uh, to my experience again, 2009. I came into an industry that was still very reliant on kind of that uh, come in, shut up, go in the corner, uh, do your time, and then uh, call me in 10 years and maybe there'll be an opportunity for you to grow. Maybe there'll be an opportunity to get paid a little bit more, more money. Maybe there'll be an opportunity for you to get promoted or, you know, get some insight in, into the industry. That's kind of what I walked into in 2009. And I, I'm feeling many of you probably had that same experience as well. But um, that is no longer true. We're uh, in an industry dynamic now in uh, 2023 that brand new people are seen as really unlimited potential. If you come in as a newbie and you put your head in the book, 
are in the books, if you put your ears in the podcast, if you put your eyes on the webinars and the conferences on the instruments in front of you, if you soak up everything that preceptor is given you, if you become best friends with the educator or your instructor, uh, you can experience explosive growth. I'm talking like you can go from brand new technician and in four or five years be managing your own department. I, I kid you not. Like that's how quickly you can grow. And tell me any other industry on the planet that you can do that in. Uh, very, very rare. And you can do it from zero to 60. And here's the important part. I'm going to go back here to part one of this. You can do it without a college degree in the United States. So let me uh, throw out here a little audience poll for those of you tuning in live or later on demand. I still want us to hear your answer uh, to this audience poll. And this is going to be talking about the degree question. So here's my poll here. Should we require a college degree to work in sterile processing? Should we require a college degree to work in sterile processing? If you're tuning in, I'd love to know your answer. Yes, college degree. No college degree to work in sterile processing in the U.S. So drop that in the comments if you're tuning in on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. I'm, I'm going to give you a little sec here to get that done. All right, so uh, let's take a look at what we're seeing here. No college degree is what I'm seeing down in YouTube. And yeah, we got a couple of answers out there in YouTube and thinking like, no, nah, uh, that's actually why they're coming to sterile processing is they don't require a college degree to get in. So uh, that's actually, uh, believe it or not, I don't know if you're following a lot of the conversations and it's hard to know what all is being talked about out there in the space. That's why videos like this are so great because I'm kind of plugged into these conversations and I hear them from both sides of the equation. And then I can bring that information to you and say, Hey, did you know a lot of people are talking about this topic? Well, this is one of the topics they're talking about. Um, do we need a college degree program uh, to better train and equip our sterile processing technicians before they come into the industry. So I'm seeing some yes answers out from the LinkedIn crowd out there. Um, we got no surprise, Paula, there that's in a, a college degree program in Ireland is saying yes, <laughs> totally, absolutely. And uh, then Janine is saying a two years degree. Uh, two years degree to move up in the future. Well, you're kind of prompting another question here that I have, Janine. So just hold that thought here just for a second. Um, and then, yeah, again, another comment here from YouTube that says, hey, but we do need some more classes, right? So it, it, this is the challenging conversation that's going on is um, over the past, you know, 30, 40 years, almost 50 years now, we've been focusing all of our effort in sterile processing on the certification route, at least here in the U.S. Uh, and the model has been across the country, no background required to get into sterile processing. You can literally walk off the street one day and then be processing instruments for an open heart procedure the next day. Now, that's not you know technically true, right? Because we don't put brand new people on trays and not watch them. But uh, you don't need to do anything. Definitely back in 2009, you didn't. And many hospitals still around the country can still can still do hire people right off the street with no prior experience, training, certification necessary, nothing. And uh, to be fair, that's how I was. Like I said, I came from Walmart. My background not in, in anything healthcare. Uh, prior to Walmart, I was washing dishes in the kitchen at the cafeteria at school. <laughs> okay. So I did have some experience washing dishes, but 
I'm going to tell you right now, sterile processing ain't nothing like washing dishes. Um, no offense to the dishwashers out there. So let me just quick segue because this is, is one of my little soapboxes. Um, it's common out there, and I know you've said it. I've probably said it, you know, years ago as well. But I want to challenge all you guys to stop saying this phrase. Uh, we're not glorified dishwashers. Uh, because what that that signals to the group of people who are dishwashers, like me, when I was washing dishes uh, to support myself, with the job and that was the job that i got and i came in and and i did the best i could uh if we're constantly throwing shade as sterile processing folks to the dishwashers and saying yeah we're not those kind of people yeah we we're not glorified dishwashers guys we're not that low we're not that dumb we're not that whatever like fill in the adjective right I mean, guys, that's that's trash. We are better than that. And the whole reason that we have that conversation is because there's other people in healthcare that throw shade at us and they call us dishwashers. And then we're like, no, we're not that. And then, yeah, there's still those dishwashers over there who also work in healthcare and and working in the hospital cafeteria. And they're just as smart as us, just as capable. Uh they care just as much about the patient as we do. The only difference between us and them is we've gotten an opportunity to work in sterile processing to get trained. And many of them, some of you tuning in, might have also come from the cafeteria, from dietary to come in sterile processing. So just drop that phrase, guys. Like stop getting defensive about it and then using and weaponizing that whole dishwasher argument like that's trash. They are awesome. Dishwashers are awesome. And yeah, glory be to dishwashers. They deserve some love and respect, just like we deserve love and respect. So let's just uh, stop it with that. Okay, <laughs> going back here to the topic at hand. So we're talking again about um, classes, about training, and specifically about degrees. For 40 and 50 years in the U.S., the model has been certification. But it's taken a long time. Like I was saying, we still got hospitals today. They'll hire people, zero experience, zero training right off the street. Now, what has changed is many hospitals today are starting to require to get certified within a certain time frame. Typically, it's like 18 months, uh, 24 months after the date of hired until you must be certified. There's a couple of states in the U.S. I want to say the current count is four, uh, but whatever the count is, it's a very small number of states today that require folks to be certified um, to do the sterile processing uh, job to get hired. And so now we're seeing more and more of these training schools pop up. Uh, to train these technicians uh, to be qualified then to apply for these roles because hospitals in those states now are starting to only hire technicians that have gone through the sterile processing training program and have that provisional uh, type of certification. But there's a whole lot of other states out there that do not today require any kind of mandatory certification to do the job. And even in our hospitals, uh, we've got that 18, 24 month uh, timeline. So let me just uh, throw out a little bomb here. I've got a little thing here. Want to throw out bombs? Okay, just hold on. All right. So that was a preemptive bomb here that I'm throwing out. Here's the bomb. Uh, Y'all. Yeah. If we're requiring two years to get certified after you're hired, like you know how many trades a technician can do in their first two years. I know technicians today, and actually Matthew Richardson that I mentioned before that we did an interview with, they've got all four of their certifications within like the first year of getting hired. I mean, they're out there churning out trades 
after the first 90 days, we set them loose and they go. Maybe they still got a preceptor beside them. Maybe there's a trainer close, you know, but after 90 days or after even six months, we set them loose. Well, what are they doing for the other, the other 18 months? They're doing trays and they're not certified. So I just think it's kind of a joke, guys. Like we cannot be patting ourselves on the back saying, hey, like we require two years. Yep. After two years, then they got to get certified. But hundreds and hundreds and thousands of trays being done today in the U.S. by technicians that are not certified. So, so I think, honestly, either we say, as a country, you got to be certified before you do your first tray, or we just give it up. Because this little halfway thing of, oh, yeah, but if you're, you're going to stick with the job, I guess, like, you need to get certified eventually. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I just do not see the consistent logic. I understand if you're tying it to career growth and that's important. Right. So like maybe let's just talk about that right now. Um, in many facilities, even like mine, I tied multiple certifications in uh, to raises and career growth opportunities. It was basically our career ladder. And what that looks like many times is you'll get hired on at like a tech one. And that's basically a technician with no experience and no certification, right? Just a basic tech. And you're, and let's say that you're making um, $12 an hour as a brand new tech one. A lot of hospitals then out there will say, okay, once you get your certification, you got to get it in two years. But as soon as you get it, let's say that you get it in six months, we'll give you a 10% raise or a 15%. In that way, the, they incentivize their technicians uh, to do more of the book study, uh, to learn the guidelines, learn the standards, learn the basics of sterile processing, right? Introduction to microbiology introduction to logistics, introduction uh, to wrapping and to steam sterilization, all the very like 101 uh, kinds of information they're incentivizing uh, through that pay raise to go and get certified in order to grow that technician up from that tech one level to the tech two level. But as great as that is, we can't really excuse or ignore all the trays again that we let them do without the certification. So either it matters for safety or uh, you know, kind of matters. It, it, it only matters for the safety of our patients if the technician has been there over two years and then before then, huh, yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? Because I'm not aware of most facilities or any facility. I'm not aware of any facilities. There may be facilities out there that uh, do extra QA for technicians trays that are not certified. There may be some out there, but I've never heard of them. T typically what I've seen is if you get off of orientation, whether you're certified or not, you're kind of free to process according to the department guidelines and training that you've been given. Uh, but there's nothing extra given to that person to, to ensure that their trays are quality until they get certified. So I think it's, it's just very inconsistent and kind of hollow. Um, I'm happy to be proven wrong, or you can argue with me all you want on that. Uh, please make your case, and you can send it to hankgetbeyondclean.net, or you can send it in the comment section below. Um, all right, so Paula has got a little comment here. This is back, you know, talking about, hey, do we require degrees? And again, for those of y'all uh, kind of tuning in here late, Paula is in a degree program in Ireland. So she says that it takes a PhD in engineering qualification to build instruments for medical professionals. A doctor is a user and he has a doctoral degree. A nurse is in the OR. And again, they have degrees, you know, BSNs is what we call them here in the States. But yet someone that doesn't even have a high school qualification carries the responsibility for the safety of the patient in breaking the chain of an infection. So in other words, it takes a doctor and agrees the whole way down, except for the person who holds the instrument's reputation on a daily basis. How does that make sense? I mean, I think 
That's a good question. That's uh, that's a good question. So we have to go back here uh, to consistency, right? And this is something that's you know really important, I think, for us to look at and talk about on an international level. And that's why I really appreciate, you know, Paula tuning in and sharing this because as our good friend, Renee Vies likes to say, he's uh, from the Netherlands, good Dutch guy. Um, he talks about, you know, microbes don't have any political boundaries. They don't need a passport to get around and they don't act any differently. So the microbes that we got in uh, the U S they're the same microbes they got over there in the UK and in Ireland, they're acting the same way. They're attacking the instruments the same way. They're trying to, uh, to attack the next patient, right? That chain of affection that behaves the same here in the U S as it does in Ireland, as it does in Saudi Arabia, as it does in South America. So why do we treat our training in sterile processing and the process so differently in all of these places? Why do we um, treat the compensation levels or the growth opportunities or the networking opportunities so different in all these places? I mean, I don't have the answer to that uh, question besides the fact to just say we need to be asking the question and we need to be challenging each other just like we are right here on this live stream of, hey, that's the way you do it. But, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right. So going back to the degrees, um, I asked a poll here earlier that says, hey, do you think we should require degrees to work in sterile processing. And Janine actually had a, a comment that uh, prompted my second poll here. So this is the second audience poll, the next one that I want to ask here. This kind of transition us here to the next stage of this conversation is, should we require a college degree to grow in sterile processing? So we've been talking about, hey, do you need a degree to get in? Or if you don't need a degree, do you at least need a certification? Do you need some kind of license uh, to go in and touch these instruments that are going to be uh, uh, touching pediatric hearts? These instruments are going to be like touching brain cells or spines. Uh, do you need any degree or certification? Do you need like structured education before you start doing that? And our answer in the U.S., at large is no, you don't need nothing. All you need is a pulse, some scrubs, and about 90 days of training, and you're good to go. <laughs> That's basically what we say. Now, there's differences of opinions, right? Like we all think, oh, no, we need more. We need to do it this way. We need to do it that way. But in terms of the legal structure and in terms of uh, the vast majority of our hospital policies, including that two-year policy that I've kind of been beaten up here, uh, we act as if, no, you don't really need anything except for a couple of months of training uh, to, to safely do these things, all right? That was the first audience poll. So here's the next one. Do we need a degree to grow? Should we say, okay, maybe we'll let you know new technicians come in and start processing in a process that's very tight and controlled it's all got standard operating procedures we've got count sheets we've got scanning all you got to do is stand at this table or at this sink and you got to do what you're told that's one category but if we want someone to lead those teams and those people you got to have some more training and that's this question would you require a college degree for uh, the supervisor or the lead tech or the director in our departments? Should that be a mandatory requirement in your opinion? If you're tuning in, uh, put your answer in the comment section below on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. And I'm going to give you a moment here to tell me, should we require a college degree to grow? in sterile processing. I'll be right back in a few moments. All right. Any guesses uh, to my opinion on this? <laughs> Have you been following my conversations enough to know where I sit on this question? Uh, yeah, so we're sitting here from YouTube 
Um, no degree required to grow is uh, the first opinion here that I've seen throw out. So honestly, you know, that's where I am too. I, if you're not getting the idea yet, I don't have a very high view of college degrees and I don't have a ton of college degrees. I mean, I got two college degrees. I was in uh, school to get a third college degree. I actually went to law school after I graduated from grad school. So I was sitting there ready to go. Um, my second year of law school, I dropped out and then I went uh, to begin a, an MBA program, Masters of Business Administration. And I dropped out of that too. So I've dropped out of two college degrees. I've gotten two college degrees. And at the end of the day, I just think, you know, college degrees, especially for where we are and what we're doing in sterile processing, I haven't yet seen one that checks enough boxes of value to say that we need to require it. And, you know, let's let's go back, I think, again, to the um, question on training and process, because some of the uh, comments and conversation that I'm seeing here on the YouTube channel is, hey, we may not need certification, we may not need degrees, but we obviously need more classes. Uh, we need to know more about infection control, for instance, if we're going to adequately do our jobs as sterile processing technicians or as sterile processing managers and, and directors. So th that's a piece of the puzzle that I'm absolutely going to agree with. When I challenge, you know, the certification mindset and the inconsistencies there, or, or when I challenge the degree requirements, and I'm going to give you a very specific example here in a moment, but when I challenge those things, don't hear me say, we don't need any training. We don't need any information. We don't need any education to be good at reprocessing medical devices, or we don't need any training and um, classes to be good at leading people. That is absolutely what we need. But do we need to spend two years or four years in a college program and pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get that information today? I, I think my answer is no. If you've gone that route or if you're going that route, that's not a bad decision. Uh, and I can speak to that you know, as well, because I've got college degrees and I'll talk here in a moment about how those college degrees have impacted um, my own career. But at a high level, you know, philosophically, I don't think that that's the direction that we need to be going as an industry. It definitely not putting all our new people through that process of hoops to say, hey, if you're going to grow, I don't care how good of a technician you are, how great of a natural leader you are. Um, I'm going to make you go to this degree program outside of this hospital. Then you can come back and maybe I'll promote you. I, that's, I'm just not, I'm not sold that that's a good plan and process. So here's my first story. When I was a sterile processing uh, director, and this probably would have been back in uh, 2015, one of the first things that I did as a new director is I sat down in the office with our job descriptions and I pulled all the job descriptions and I got them all in front of me and I compared them all. And, you know, if you've never done that before, I think that it's probably a good process in general to get eyes as a new leader on all your department's job descriptions, because if you're posting jobs out there, that's the job description that your HR recruiter is using. And if you've never seen how your department is describing those jobs, you could be in a little bit of trouble. Maybe that's why you don't get people applying. Maybe you're not describing the job very well. But uh, specifically the jobs that are beyond that tech one position, right? So what's your job description for tech two? What's your job description for tech three? And your specialist are your specialty positions, like if you have a quality assurance technician or if you have a database uh, specialist, if you have an OR liaison, if you've got an educator, if you've got a uh, a team lead, a supervisor, a manager. So I sat down in my office as a new director with all these job descriptions. And one of the first things I did is I took out these education requirements. To become a manager, 
when I became a manager in 2013, uh, the current job description required a college degree. And I was so irritated. Now, I had a college degree, <laughs> right? So lucky for me, I qualified, but I didn't get that college degree because, let's see, I graduated college in uh, 2007 with my undergrad. I, I didn't get that college degree thinking six years down the road, I'm going to be applying for a manager position in sterile processing. That wasn't the reason that I got it. I, I don't know why I got it. Uh, that's a whole nother conversation, but, um, thankfully I qualified. So I got that manager position. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't hit all the qualifications. They wanted like uh, 10 years experience, uh, to manage this sterile processing department. And in 2013, I had four years experience. Yep. So that goes, uh, to a conversation about how good bosses can give you opportunities, whether or not you're qualified for them or not. And that's, that's such an important theme. Um, it's gone through many of our podcast and other live streams as well. So if you catch yourself a good boss, uh, you know, do not take that good boss for granted because they can find ways many times, not every time, but they can find ways sometimes to get you in positions that on paper you're not technically qualified for, but l let me go back to my story, right? So I'm sitting here in my office, all these job descriptions on. I remember keenly that when I became the manager, I, I didn't meet all the qualifications. Thankfully, I had a college degree, but uh, I didn't really think that a degree should be required to manage a sterile processing department. Well, so I take out my little pen and I start crossing all those things out on all the job descriptions and saying, no, you do not need a college degree to manage a department well. You need to know a lot about sterile processing and you need to know a lot about people and teams and quality and communication. But do you need to sit for four years in some random classes talking about you know, business administration that doesn't know jack squat? about what's going on in the average sterile processing department? My answer to that is no. Uh, so I see some comments here. Let me just take a quick pause. I see some comments coming in from LinkedIn and from the YouTube. Uh, we got a totally agree from somebody on LinkedIn. I don't know exactly who that is, but thank you for totally agreeing. I love to hear that. Um, we got some more comments here from uh, Chris over on the YouTube channel. I think classes are good to prepare to work in that area and also can help to weed out the people that may not be right for the position. Hey, that's an important point there, Chris. I'm going to grant you that. Uh, the whole weed out factor, you know, you, as a trainer, especially as an educator and even as a department leader, and heck, let me just throw everybody in as your coworkers. You want to know sooner rather than later if that person that you're training is not going to stick around because the more time and effort and hours and weeks and months that you put into training this person when deep down inside, they're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking for another job right now, but I'm just not going to tell you until I find it. And they may hang out for four or five months and you're just like pouring everything into them, hoping and praying that this person's going to help you with that surgical volume you know, six months down the road and only to find out their heart and their mind was not in it. So you're right. Uh, classes and putting folks, you know, through classes early on in that process to just expose them to the complexity of the job, the responsibility of the job, the risk of the job. I think that's very, very important to get that message across. Uh, we got another uh, comment here from Alan over on the YouTube channel. If you're tuning in again from LinkedIn or Twitter, you can stay there. You can keep watching us on those platforms. But do me a favor, either now or after the stream, go to YouTube and subscribe. Uh, that way you can get notified of streams like this and new videos and conferences that we put out through the YouTube channel. So Alan over at YouTube says, leadership is my passion. I'm currently a supervisor working toward management, how would you suggest we make the case against required college degrees if we work in a system that requires a degree? So yeah, you're going to be making the case, I think, first to your boss, your manager, your director. And you know, um, 
this is not necessarily one of those situations that you have to go up the chain of command, right? So like if your boss, if you already know your boss is not supportive of you or not supportive of the change in that requirement, well, just talk to someone else in the health system. Maybe your OR manager is more friendly to this conversation. Maybe the HR recruiter is or your HR business partner. But find someone in your hospital, in your facility, that will just talk to you about what the job is. I'll be honest. A lot of these HR folks that enforce these requirements, they ain't got a clue what it takes to run a department well. They're looking at the job description that hasn't been updated in 20 years from the sterile processing department and saying, okay, so must be able to lift 50 pounds. Okay, good. Let's see. Let's be able to stand all day on their feet. Good. All right. So that's like, literally, that's all they know. I bet you money, the vast majority of the recruiters that are in all your hospitals that you're tuning in from never set foot once in sterile processing that you, you can take that to the bank. So they don't really know. So um, start with them or start with your manager. If they're friendly, just sit them down and be like, hey, can you explain to me with data? And this is actually the final part of this conversation. Um, can you show me with data why we require a college degree uh, to manage or to supervise or to be a director. Why is that required? And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little secret. There ain't no data. There, there is no data <laughs> that says that uh, a person X with a college degree is a better manager in sterile processing than person Y without a college degree. There ain't no data. The answer is um, twofold because that's what everybody else does. And that's uh, true. And uh, that's the way that we've always done it. There's one more answer that goes to the money piece. And I'm going to answer that here next. Uh, but those are the two answers, right? They don't have any data. And I see your question down there, Emmanuel. So I'm going to get to that in a second. Just hold tight for me here. Um, so, yeah, you're having that conversation with your manager and just asking, hey, can you show me the data? Well, they're not going to have any, da any data because there is none. And then, you know, they're going to be explaining, hey, um, we believe because we just want to make sure that someone has, you know, the general skill set to be able to lead teams and like understands how to communicate and understands uh, the basics of business, et cetera. Well, none of that, again, none of that has to go through that college route. So to begin the conversation, you should, you know, do this very uh, um, delicately and strategically, but uh, challenge your manager or your recruiter or your director to say, hey, someone wrote this job description at some point. It may not have been you, but some person sitting down in a seat just like yours sat down and typed this up, which means some person just like you can sit down and change it. You can update it. We can change job descriptions. We can change the titles and the roles and the requirements. Now, here is the complicating factor, and this is the challenge, right? And this is the money piece. Way back when I got my manager position, and then again, when I got my director position, which I, again, was not qualified for on paper, uh, the manager position, I think, required uh, 10 years, like I said, experience, and I only had four when I applied and I got it. And the director position might have required like 15 years and like uh, 10 years of leadership, <laughs> right? And I became a director in 2015. So I had six years total experience and I had like two, three years of uh, total leadership experience. So I'm, I, I, I mean, on paper, I was like not even in the ballpark uh, qualified to 
be a system director in sterile processing in my health system. Um, but what they told me way back then, and what you know, what my boss at that time told me is um, the pay rate, the compensation was tied to the degree requirement. Meaning the reason that the sterile processing manager pay was in a certain range was because it required a college degree. And if, if it did not require a college degree, um, that it would not be able to remain in that, in that pay grade. So if I, if I didn't have a college degree for a manager, even if they gave me the job, they wouldn't be able to give me that pay grade because the pay grade is tied to my education. Same thing with the director. Um, and I want to say, and this is a whole nother hot potato question. Um, I want to say even the director job required it to be a nurse. So yeah, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> do you need to be a nurse uh, to be a sterile processing manager or a sterile processing director? I know uh, a lot of systems, maybe the VA, even the Veterans Administration, and the government, I know a lot of systems out there are saying, hey, you got to be a nurse. I mean, they were talking about that way back in uh, uh, 2009 and definitely in 2013 when I, I first became a manager. Uh, so they may not be talking about it as much anymore because of the staffing crisis. But, uh, yeah, I, that's, a, that's a whole other ball of wax. So, um, all right, I'm going to get to Emmanuel's question here. So Emmanuel said, and I'll go ahead and pop this on the screen here. So we're having a lot of good conversation today through YouTube. So I appreciate all y'all uh, tuning in and chatting here. Uh, do we need a college degree to be a supervisor in sterile processing technician job? So um, uh, your answer, that's no. Thankfully, today, you do not need a college degree to be a supervisor in most sterile processing departments. Now, the one exception or the exceptions out there may be, hey, if you're in like an ambulatory surgery center and there is no manager and there is no director, like supervisor is at the top of the pyramid and then you've got people who work underneath you in that ASC, uh, depending on that job role and the job description, those job requirements, that may be like a weird exception that they'll say, hey, you do need a college degree. But for the most part, uh, your supervisors do not. It's only when you kind of get to that management level and above that for no good reason, no good data reason, you start seeing all these job descriptions start adding that. So when I was a director, boom, I cut it out. And then the question goes back to, okay, well, how do you build in a career ladder? Like how do you know when people are qualified to go up the step? What differentiates these people that you're working with that are great technicians, but maybe not qualified to be a supervisor? And honestly, we see a lot of that in the industry in departments that are not really running well. Is you see departments that have um, promoted great technicians. They're really good at their technician job. They knew the instruments. Uh, a uh, great relationship with the operating room, a lot of trust, you know, always on time, very hard workers. They promote those people into the supervisor job that has to deal with people and people problems. And they have to look at kind of the bigger picture of the department. They can't just laser focus on their assignment or their job. And many of those supervisors and managers, when they get promoted for the same way, they fail. And they fail, not because they're not great workers, uh, just because they weren't actually good leaders. And no one knew that. Even maybe that person didn't know that they didn't have quite yet what it took to be a leader. Not that they couldn't learn or, or be trained, but they just didn't have it. And so we kind of push these people sometimes and we see, oh, hey, like they're a great worker. We push them up a little higher and faster. Now, this goes back to the degree conversation, though. If you see the other side, yeah, no problem, Manuel. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if you see the other side of the equation, though, and you see someone young, 
and I'm not talking about an age, but you see someone like a new, um, a new blood to sterile processing, regardless of their age, and you start seeing signs of natural leadership. These are people who they walk in a room and everyone's just kind of looking over their direction saying, hey, like, what's Deborah going to do today? Because whatever Deborah wants us to do, wants us to focus on, I kind of want to do what Deborah says, right? Like, that's just that kind of... Uh, that many people just naturally have that impact on people uh, because of the way they carry themselves, because of the way they speak, because of the way that they treat other people. It's uh, it's not necessarily like a motherly uh, response, but it's kind of a blend between like mother fatherly response to people that you care for people like a mother would do. But then like a father, you also push people. Uh, to take risk, to go out there and like uh, to push themselves to work a little faster than what they thought they could work or to pay a little bit more attention than they did last time, call them out on issues um, or, you know, errors maybe that they've had. And, you know, people can do that without the title. A natural leader as a technician, like they'll learn how to navigate that. Like you're not coming over someone's shoulder and be like, hey, Johnny, I saw that you made an error in your heart tray and I just want to let you know, don't do that again. Right. Like that is offensive and you deserve to be punched in the nose for that kind of, that's not natural leadership. That's just annoyance. But there's people out there that have that in them already. And maybe they just have one year experience or two years experience, but you know, two years, you can learn a ton about sterile processing in two years in a strong department, with strong education, with strong resources, with a lot of support. And if you're being hired in or promoted, uh, let's say that you're two years in and there's a supervisor job open. If you've got a strong manager and if you've got other strong leaders in that department and you're like this brand newbie uh, two years in, never led anything before in your life, but you really want it and you have some of those natural skill sets, totally, you can thrive in that scenario because you've got other leaders around that can kind of walk alongside you to coach you, to mentor you, to say after you, you, you kind of bombed on that huddle to say, hey, um, maybe not say it that way <laughs> again. Maybe don't let that person talk so much in the huddle because it went 30 minutes instead of three minutes. I just kind of learn that lesson next time. Like if you have those kind of leaders around you, it can really add a, a bunch of value to that new leader that in another scenario, if there's only one supervisor in the whole department and your manager is kind of MIA, they're always busy, they're in meetings, they're not really looking to mentor you, it, it just may not be a good fit for you if you don't have any of that kind of natural support structure around you. So um, just because you don't get the job or just because you don't thrive in the job that you get as a supervisor, as a manager, your first time around doesn't mean that you don't have what it takes. It may just mean that you weren't set up to succeed from the very beginning. All right. Um, any other questions that you have in this stream? I'm planning on going. I'll keep on going for as long as you guys want to keep on going. If you got more questions or comments, just throw them out and we'll tackle those. I do have a couple more things I want to go over here, uh, too, along the way. So I think I'm going to ask another uh, poll here because the first couple polls had some uh, good conversation come out of it. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about money because we've been talking a lot about degrees so let's uh, talk a little bit more about the money. And this is a fun poll and conversation that I've been having, you know, probably since 2013. So maybe 10 years, kind of crazy. So a whole decade, I've been asking this kind of question to really change the way that we think in sterile processing about pay. So here's a question. Should production or productivity and quality bonuses be a thing, right? So this is an audience poll. If you're tuning in LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, I want to know what you think about this question. Should production and quality bonuses of technicians be a thing? 
and you can think about this as an individual. If you're just uh, got terrific quality at the end of the year, should you get a bonus for that? If you got ter uh, terrific production, if you're the workhorse, should you get a bonus for that? Or as a team, let's say that your team just uh, killed it on the quality and production. You like you broke all the records, you produce all the instruments, and you did it at the same time that you're short staffed. Uh, should you get a bonus for that? So that's the audience poll. I'm going to give you a little bit to put your answers in the comment section below. Just drop them in. They'll pop across my screen here and I'll see what y'all have to say about that. I'll be right back in uh, just a few seconds. All right, so um, should you get a bonus because you're so fast or you're so good? And hopefully you're so fast and you're so good <laughs> because that's always the pushback. <laughs> is, oh, no, 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 we can't go fast because we got to be good. Well, yeah, and I've done a number of videos and I've written a lot of articles about this. Uh, you can go probably faster than what you're going right now and you can be safer probably than you are right now. You can improve at both your speed and your quality. Uh, so don't give me any of this. I got to go, you know, one mile a minute uh, because I don't want to make a mistake. You can learn to do these things well, the same way that surgeons increase their time in doing surgery. I mean, are they decrease their time, right? Like they do the surgeries quicker. Just because they're able to do a surgery quicker does not mean that they're taking shortcuts. It, and does not mean that they're putting the patient at risk. Same thing with our trays. Many of us can learn to produce quicker and not cut any corners and still keep that quality as high as we uh, can. So I see uh, some answers out here. Uh, yeah, we're seeing, yeah, probably some kind of bonus would be uh, great. We got a yes over here from Solyndra on uh, the LinkedIn side of things. Alan says, in a perfect world, bonuses would be nice. And, and Emmanuel says, yeah, I support that idea. Well, I'm not surprised that most of y'all said yes, because we're talking about us getting paid, right? Like, yeah, the answer is going to be, yeah, we'd love to have bonuses uh, to incentivize. So this is the important uh, background for this question and the reason that I ask it. Um, I think one of the challenges in our, in our industry, and I'm going to, I'm going to drop another bomb here. All right, so the bomb is I don't think we have done a good job yet of incentivizing our technicians to do their jobs excellently. And the reason that we've gotten by so far is because there is a, a percentage of the workforce, there's a percentage of our department that have intrinsic motivation. Inside, that's what drives them. They're coming into work and they're going to work as hard at uh, doing sterile processing and they're going to go home and they're going to work just as hard trying to beat their kid in checkers, right? Like they're just bringing a hundred percent to whatever they do, no matter what, because they're driven on the inside. They got that intrinsic motivation. However, there is a percentage of our department and our coworkers that need some kind of extrinsic motivation. They need a push in the back or a kick in the butt, or they need, you know, something to be looking forward to that reward at the end of the race. And that's what those kinds of people want. And, you know, historically, we just we don't give those kinds of people what they need uh, beyond, you know, recognition. Right. Which is extremely important. We want to give hand claps, want to give gold stars. We want to give uh uh, trophies. We used to do like trophy ceremonies in my department. Anytime people got their three certifications. So, um, there's a lot of recognition things you can do, but historically we've just really stunk at that, uh, to tie incentives, uh, to high quality and high numbers of production in our department. So this bonus question, I'm just going to flash this up again so people can see, that's what this bonus question is kind of getting at is, hey, like, let's tie money. The Benjamins, 
uh, to the productivity, to their quality, like to their errors, right? Like you can come back to Susie and say, Susie, man, you keep forgetting to take the light cord adapter off of the scope before you process it. How many times I got to tell you that, Susie, and I can't fire you for this. So what am I going to do? Well, if you flipped it and you had some kind of intrinsic motivation, not just, you know, for the light cord adapters, but let's just say for tray errors. And you told Susie, hey, Susie, the average tray error in the whole department is uh, three tray errors a year for everybody. So everyone is averaging about three. If you, Susie, can go all year with zero errors, you'll get a $100 bonus. Boom. Maybe that's all Susie needs to pay a little bit more attention to that light cord adapter. Not always, right? And this is just like one little scenario. But that's what I'm saying is people are driven differently. And we got to get more creative as an industry, I think, uh, to hit that other percentage of the department and start pushing that production higher, start pushing that quality higher, and just relying on that intrinsic motivation that uh, for some people that's enough, but for many people it's not. All right, so here's another poll, and this is this is getting at it. This is the little bomb again. I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna make you watch that bomb video uh, just quite yet. So uh, here's another one though that gets uh, to the heart of the question, and it's actually I don't like the word fair. I mean, it it, it irritates me to even have questions about fairness. As a manager and director, when people start to come in my office saying it's not fair, I, I mean, uh, I almost immediately I would just stop the conversation and go back and redirect because uh, talking about fair is so difficult to define objectively. That's like a subjective word. We want to say, I don't feel it's fair. Uh, but at the end of the day, like we got to deal with data in sterile processing. And uh, the data says, and this is the question here, are flat annual raises for everyone fair? In your health system, like a lot of health systems may not even be doing this uh, like since COVID. Uh, I'd be interested to know if any of you guys have gotten a flat raise in recent years. But I want to go to this incentive piece. And I want to ask you high performers, if you're watching this stream on a Friday afternoon, I can probably will tell you you're a high performer deep down inside there's something in you that's just you're the kind of nerd that's going to be watching this live stream after work or during your break or whatever so um if you're carrying a larger percentage of the volume in your department if you're processing more of the trays if you're handling more of the problems if you're the one making the phone call to the or to work out the situation in room three if you're the one always calling Biomed because of the washers down, if you're the one that's always stepping up to work the weekends or the holidays when everyone else doesn't want to, do you think it's fair that everybody at the end of the year then gets the same raise? The people who are at the top uh, 20% uh, carrying the bottom 80% of the department out there, should everyone get the same 2 3 4 5% raise? Let me know what you think. I know I've kind of made my own case um, clear, but I'm really curious to see what you think in the comment section below. Should we all just get the same raise every year, regardless of how good or bad we've done? I'm going to give you a couple of moments here to drop your answer in the comments section below, and I'll be right back. All right, so I uh, I probably scared a few of y'all off to tell me your answer if you disagree. But, hey, this is a safe space. You can disagree with me all day and uh, twice on Sunday. I will not get my feelings hurt. Uh, yeah, I asked that question again to get to this incentive piece. How can we incentivize our hard workers to work harder? And how can we incentivize our not-so-hard workers to get with the program? And are we... Are we disincentivizing our not so hard workers when they get a raise no matter what, just because they happen to be on a team that's uh, carrying them to the championship? It's kind of like, hey, um, if you're on the Super Bowl team, 
you get the ring, even if you never set foot on the field. <laughs> That's kind of how we treat our annual raises at their flat raises. Like you all get the same raise. It's like we're on uh, uh, one of the Oprah shows, right? You get a car, you get a car, you all get a car. Well, that's how we are. And, you know, it's great for hard workers because it's like, yeah, I deserve the car. I deserve the ring. But, you know, for those who need a little kick in the butt, a little push in the back, I, I just don't see these kind of across the line flat raises really doing what they should be doing, which is driving that growth. Uh, yeah, so we do see some feedback here from the YouTube side of things. Thank you, all you YouTube guys, for hanging in with us. Uh, we see, hey, they shouldn't get the same raise. So they should get a raise, potentially, but not the same raise as those really high performers out there carrying everyone. And then uh, we got a comment here. Uh, causes resentment and losses in morale. Not a good idea. The people in our department who care are the pillars that carry our department. In my opinion, they deserve more um then you're reading my mind chris um do we keep some kind of individual stats so this is the question i'm gonna put you up on the screen just to reward you for that great question right so are there some kind of stats that are kept uh tied to this question of incentives of production and quality and the answer uh practically speaking is no there's not enough that's kept. Thankfully, with more and more of us getting tracking systems out there today, we have more data now than we've ever had before. So I'm not going to argue with that. We're much closer to being able to tie those stats in the way that uh, could help us have these valuable discussions. We're much closer to that than we've ever been before. But not enough data. Um, and actually, I think, let me see here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Well, let me just add, this is my last poll question here. So we're just going to go a couple more minutes, but I want to get into this data question here. And I really want to leave you with some food for thought as you go back to your departments, if you talk to your bosses, as you talk to your coworkers. And this is my hope, as you talk to other folks in the industry, your peers out there, to challenge them through Facebook, through LinkedIn, through YouTube, through email, at the conferences that you're going to, like, let's challenge the status quo on what we require for degrees and certification, how we have these money conversations, and in this last piece, how we think about data as it relates to the individual, driving incentives and rewarding high performers. How do we get that data? And then how do we communicate that data and compare that data to make these kinds of decisions? So here's my last question. This is the last poll here, and then we'll talk a little bit about it and wrap it up for today. What kind of data do you think creates the most value for your career? So this is kind of, uh, let's talk the present and the future, right? So let's just answer first, what kind of data today creates the most value for your career growth? And then you can also answer, what kind of data do you want that maybe you don't have today? that could help you grow more in the future. So uh, drop your answers in the comment section below. I'm going to do the little audience poll video one last time here, and we'll come back and we'll talk about it. What kind of data? I think, um, no surprise, we need data that drills down into instruments processed, into sets processed, into loads sterilized, into sets decontaminated. Um, and all that's got to tie back to quality. And this is the real missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, even our tracking systems that do track the production side of things so i can tell you hey uh chris you've processed 120,000 instruments in 2022 i can tell you that but typically what i can't tell you is how many errors you've had in those instruments oftentimes because errors they're 
uh, tracked in different systems. Maybe they're tracked on paper and they get thrown away. Like maybe you come get a coaching from your supervisor. And it's like, hey, Chris, you left that insert on the Fogarty clamp again. You got to stop doing that. And then you're like, you know, bad boy, don't do that again, Chris. Well, then they throw that little piece of paper in the trash and they go make a note and they say, yeah, we coached Chris. Now he knows not to leave that little insert on and it's done. And so you don't even have your quality data to compare to your production data. And a lot of our folks are sitting over there in, and man, they're looking at all the trays they process and all the instruments they process and all the sets that they've decontaminated and, and all the loads they've sterilized. And they're thinking, man, I'm king of the world. Right? I'm just, I'm just blowing and going, right? Like I am number one over here. Well, what they don't know and what nobody knows because we don't have the data is, yeah, but are you also the leader in errors? Are you the leader in, you know, sending dirty instruments out of the dirty side into the clean side and people are constantly have to, to bring those cannulas back because you don't take five seconds uh, to brush them or actually or like 30 seconds to brush them and to flush them like the IFU says. We don't have that data. We're not tracking. If we are tracking errors, many times we're only tracking reactive errors. And by that, I mean only the stuff that makes it all the way to the OR, all the way to the sterile field, all the way that creates a big enough issue that the OR nurse stops what they're doing, documents it, and then takes that piece of paper somewhere, and then it gets captured. That's It's got to be a big error for it to go all the way through and actually get it back to sterile processing. Then again, where does it go there? Is it getting documented? We're not really capturing all the little errors, like I said, the dirty instruments that are coming into the clean side from decontamination. We're just like catching them and being like, gosh, he just can't get it right back there and take it back, yell at him and say, slow down, do what you're supposed to do. And uh, yeah, without that documentation, we really can't say, are the production numbers that we're seeing, are they actually quality production? I'm going to uh, go find an article. I don't have the link ready, so I'm going to have to find this and add it in the comment section later. But I wrote an article about usable units of service, and I kind of make this case that we're measuring productivity today in our departments only based on how many instruments and sets can we shove through the process? How fast can we get them in to the sterilizer and get them out the other side? That's literally all that we're measuring. How many hours does it take and how many trays can we shove through that sterilizer? We're not asking any anything about where are those trays, quality trays, were actually usable in the operating room. So that would be like, you know, a Ford Motor Company uh just saying, hey, uh, this year we put 100,000 trucks off of our production line. Only, you know, 20 of them were drivable, but man, we really made a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's what we do, guys, in sterile processing across the country, probably across the globe, where all we're measuring is, hey, how many of those trays can you get through? And no one's asking, are, are those trays actually usable? Now, we do track errors. In the OR, we track delayed cases and cancel cases, but that's not getting tied back to our productivity. So all we're being measured is how quickly can we do this, not how quickly and how qualitatively can we do it. So that's that's a little thing to chew on. If you haven't heard that uh, concept before, the usable units of service, take that back to your boss and, you know, blow their mind on Monday when you walk into the office with that question. I hope that you have been inspired. I hope you've been challenged. And more importantly, I hope you found something that's going to help you take your career to the next level in sterile processing. If you're not familiar with what is, what's going on at Beyond Clean, this is a platform that was built by sterile processing for sterile processing. We are of you and we are for you. And we want you and your voice to come and add uh, questions and content and insight uh, through our platform. So you can come be a guest on the podcast. You can write articles for us. You can speak at our conferences. You can comment on the live streams like all of y'all have been doing today. Uh, a tremendous engagement. A great audience. I'm so happy 
and proud of you for spending your Friday afternoon here with me again. And um, I do want to leave you here before we uh, turn off. So we got these um, sterile processing word puzzle books. They are live right now on Amazon. I actually put the link before we started the live stream. Um, we got a volume one and we got a volume two. And both of these puzzle books are approved for five CEs. So you get all the puzzles, you get all the hours of fun, but you also get five CEs for your time. Those are great gifts for new technicians coming into your department or just the sterile processing nerd in your life. It's a great gift, obviously, for sterile processing week when it hits in the fall as well. Uh, so, yeah, go check that out. And uh, until we see you again, like we say here at Beyond Clean, I want each and every one of you to keep fighting dirty. And we'll see you all again soon. Bye.